Okay, uh, is the recording on? Microphone, uh, mic is on. Ha okay, hello, good morning. And uh, I'm Peter. I'm a Postgres developer, and this is the story of my life. <laughs> so, I, I want to talk about uh, various tools that uh, I and others have have thrown at the Postgres code to find uh, bugs and other issues. Um, I'm glad we're in this room because the other room was so dark I, I was almost falling asleep. So, what is this? So let's start with something simple. Um, have you ever written a C program like a one-off to just do a test case and you compiled it and it seemed to compile fine and you ran it and it crashed immediately and then you noticed you did everything wrong because the compiler didn't warn you about any of the problems? So if, if, you, um, if you have done that, then you, you will know that without compiler warnings, a C compiler is worthless. So that, that, is, that is why we uh, in, in Postgres have um, put a lot of effort into both uh, cleaning up existing warnings to the point of uh, one or zero, depending on how you look at the flex issue. and. Uh, continue to add uh, a, a new warning. So this is the current set we, uh, we're using by default. And uh, if you just look through, uh, the, the uh, WR is obviously the big one. But if you look through all the other ones and you imagine how your life would be if you didn't have those, it, it would be quite uh, sad. <laughs> so that is the set we're using. And, uh, and you know we're pretty comfortable with it. This is, uh, are we all on screen? Yeah, this is actually what. Uh, I tend to use in my own builds, um, especially the, the, so there are a couple of groups here. The first two are, the, the first one is not really a warning option, but what it does, it, it in on glibc slash Linux, um, it uh, changes the definition of, uh, of uh, several uh, library functions, so they uh, declare themselves that you shouldn't ignore their return values and things like that. And that, in combination with the other warning options, then gives you warnings if you, if you, um, if you uh, miss error, uh, checking the return code of a function, for example, which could uh, lead to security problems. Yeah, how, how are we playing? How are we playing that? Well, how, how well, uh, how much code? well, uh, we are currently not getting any garbage because of two reasons. One is I always have this on in my own build, so I would find it pretty soon. The other is that on uh, Ubuntu, they have somehow hard-coded this into their compiler, so they're always building with this. So the the original reason why we actually sort of started cleaning that up is that we got these uh, reports from U Ubuntu people. Yeah, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to that. So uh, um, there, the, the, uh, we'll get to Coverity in a moment. So uh, logical op is also something I'm using there. Th that finds issues like if you have a, a, an if statement like if, if x is greater than 0 in, and x is less than 5, that would be OK. If you flip that around, if x is less than 0 and x is greater than 5, you know, that could be a typo. It would find that. So that's actually pretty useful and actually has found at least one bug in Postgres uh, a few years ago. I, I actually submitted patches to make both of these a default a while ago, if you recall. But the problem is that in very old uh, GCC compilers that people are still using, they pr produce a lot of garbage because uh, the, I guess the older compilers were not as smart uh, to, uh, to, um, to produce useful. Uh, is, is this the Tom Fox thing? Is it what? Is this the Tom thing? No, this was not. It has nothing to do with the, you know, the, the, those were reasonable. Pl I, I don't remember the details, but those were reasonable platforms. They were just a few years older. So, and and this is the sort of the story that is is uh, is a problem with all of these. You you want to add, you know, these are other ones. The the second group there is uh, things that I sometimes also use. They haven't really found much, but so you could use them. The third group there is uh, something that I use with Clang specifically. And uh, the, uh, the the ones below there are new in Clang 3.4, so they 
they haven't really found anything yet, but they are also sort of on the, on the, on the horizon, on the roadmap, so to speak. But the problem is really you can't make these the defaults for the reasons that I mentioned because different compiler generations produce different sort of nonsense for that. So if you want to maintain the, uh, uh, what we have, um, you know, the, the zero count of the, of the warnings, uh, it's really hard to move forward. You know, that, that's a, a kind of an annoying issue. So it, it's, it's going to, you know, people who are interested in this will basically have to do this manually uh, going forward also. You, you could, yeah, but that, yeah, you could do that. You, could, you just have to do a lot of work to, uh, to. I think a better plan would be to have like a bit plan that you're talking about. So, yeah, I, I don't want to spend too much time on the warnings, but yeah, there's obviously a lot of, a lot of fiddling we could do to make this better. Yeah, well, that's oh, another well, issue that, that many, many issues here, right? That's good. All, all good notes. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing, I'll, one thing I always do, uh, did you have a question? Sorry. One thing I always do is compile with uh, W error, which turns all warnings into errors. And uh, I have done this successfully, so to speak, uh, for almost five, eight years. I don't know. So which... Uh, because if I compile code and it flies by, I don't see the warnings. I need to have a Boolean answer from the compiler. That's just my workflow. The problem is if you pass W error into configure, configure fails because it generates warnings internally as part of its testing. And the uh, workaround I use, so to speak, is I have a shell alias that does this sort of thing. So if you, you can, if you want to do this, you can take a photo, take a photo or look at the uh, thing later. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, this works for me because actually the shell alias I, I, I use is much longer because it also picks different options for different branches and so on. So, but uh, that for me is useful and I think everyone else should look into that because it's really helpful. The problem right now is I'm always the first one to find the warnings yeah. if someone accidentally commits one, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm happy if I've chosen this path. So here is uh, a chart uh, I, I computed uh, over the weekend, which you know caused this computer to heat up my office for a while as it wasn't building all this, um, and this kind of shows the the uh, you know the progress of of compilers becoming more and more either smarter or annoying depending on how you interpret it, and also uh, us um, you know catching up uh, with them, and um, you can sort of see a. You know, a diagonal here as, as time uh, progresses. The, the problem with this is, you know, going back to the W error issue, is if you need to make a change, let's say you need to backpatch something into 9.0 right now, you need to, you know, either very carefully look at the warnings or, or not that your, your compile generates, or you need to, you know, pull up this chart and then actually try to install GCC 4.4 and build that because that was current at the time. So. That is uh, very annoying and pretty much an unsolved issue for working in, in back branches. So I, I don't know how to fix that other than keeping a lot of old compilers around, which I essentially do. But not all platforms have the option to install all that, you know, those old things. So that's kind of hard. Um, in case you're curious what this is, in uh, the, a lot of the uh, options in 8.3 was that the, the compiler was complaining that inlining failed and that generates hundreds of warnings almost and then we later turned that off and in GCC 4.6 they added uh, variable was set but not used which apparently Postgres did a lot so another issue with this is uh, a lot of developers build with assertions enabled but if you turn the assertions off, you get a different set of warnings because sometimes a warning uh, variable is used or not. So some, sometimes those sort of problems actually get, don't get detected for a long time until someone builds without assertions. So it's very difficult. Yeah, we mentioned already build form doesn't do anything about warnings, so this doesn't help. But uh, over in the other talk, we um, Rob Pike was mentioned, who is also the uh, the uh, creator, one of the creators of Go, the programming language, um, which you know you can have different opinions about, but. One interesting thing they did, they don't have any compiler warnings. It's either an error or not. So, which makes you know, this, uh, this sort of uh, thing much easier, uh, which I think was, is, a, is a good decision. 
So now we were talking. You, you yes. Yeah, okay, so uh, the 36, this is on Mac OS 10 version 10.9 specifically, those 30, 36, if you're on a Linux platform, you might not get those. This is a, I argue it's a bug, I filed a bug with GCC about it. It complains if the right-hand side of a comma operator does not have a side effect. <laughs> okay, yeah, and, and th th this, 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 this is a new warning they introduced, and this happens in the system headers of the operating system for in, in various macro expansions, and they're not very smart about that. So y you might not see this, but if you're, if you're me and you develop on this 50% of the time and you run with W arrow, then this is, you know, GCC 4.9 is broken for me at the moment, so I, I actually use 4.8. Yes, please. I know a lot of people have. I've seen exactly. in discussions that people have macros or things that do that. I, in my experience, it always works. Yeah. Or if not, I fix it. But yeah, yeah. see, that's, that's the other thing you can do also. So. Yeah. Although I do wonder, I mean, you could turn on the WRO for the virtual operator, which is one of the virtual operators. Yeah, that's what yeah. It is kind of, yeah, it, it, obviously there are obscure platforms where it is not zero at the moment because. We're actually going through the early stages of testing whether it is valid. Yeah, well, we're also pretty good on Clang, but of course, on if you use, like, for example, the Solaris, uh, whatever it's called, Sun, former Sun Studio, uh, you get a, a bunch of different things, and it's not it's not easy to turn them off as far, they don't really have these options, so on those kind of platforms, you're pretty much screwed at the moment, but let's talk about Coverity. Um, so the, the, the compiler option, the, the, the way the compiler options or uh, compiler uh, warnings are designed is so they don't slow down the compilation so much, right? So the next level of, of intensity here, so to speak, is the static analysis tools uh, that are specifically designed to produce essentially as many uh, warnings as uh, possible at, at the expense of being super slow to build. And uh, Coverity was kind of the, the first that at least came to our attention in, on, a, on a broad scale. And they, so Coverity came out of a research project, but it's a commercial company. They sell this product for a lot of money, I hear, to do statically analyze your C or C++ code. And started doing that in around 2005, they started this open source program. I think that was also somehow government sponsored and built a bunch of open source projects and, and made this uh, publicly available. And they have built, uh, sort of expanded this platform over time. And, and now it's almost to the degree that anyone can sign up and, and, and submit builds there. But the results are still under some kind of license. So I, I can't really go into too much details without not knowing what I'm getting myself into. Well, are you associated with that company? How can you? Well, we'll, we'll have another example, which is the Clang scan build, which is open source that we can drill into deeper. They are very similar. It just uh, clarity goes a little bit deeper. So if you want to, OK, so first of all, we have kind of made the decision that the only people who should have access to this is who the people who are also on the security team because there could be security issues in there. So if you're not on that team, what you, <laughs> what you can do is you just submit your own project to Coverity and just dump it open source source code. <laughs> and if you figure that out, you have the results yourself. That's uh, <laughs> homework. But if, you, if you're one of the, you know, of the inner circle, so to speak, and you want to have access to this, you uh, can talk to Stephen Frost primarily. But I'm also an admin on this, and Magnus is also an admin on this, so we, we could help you out. This is the URL. You can go. I think we'd be, we might keep this and get to a point where we actually have everything cleaned up. Yeah. I think we'd be more yeah. willing to open As you up. can see, there's, That's you know, there's a lot of things. <coughs> so uh, I found in the commit log 71 issues yeah. mentioned. Well, that's <laughs> debatable. Well, it's hard to you know have that argument about uh, 1,500, right? It would be more easy to have that argument about 150, right? So we don't know. <laughs> well, I, I, I 
we have been through, yes, between you and yeah. myself and others, we have been through a lot of those. But so, yeah, we're, I'll show an example in a moment of what that kind of looks like. We have, uh, I found 71 commits, <coughs> which doesn't mean there were 71 issues. There were probably more in the order of two or 300 people I'll use commits, bunched a bunch of things together. So a lot of those are in the region of memory leaks or, or memory access problems. So as it says here, there are 1,501 issues outstanding. Again, we have disqualified most of those, but who, who really knows? Um, uh, if you, again, if you're one of the developers, uh, you, you can get access to that if you want. Um, Coverity um, put out a, a notification that they detect a hard bleed bug, which you know, was, was a recent security vulnerability. So they added that a week after it was came out, so that didn't help. But uh, that's the sort of level they work on. So they do, uh, you know, taint checks of they check where data comes from and then warn you about if you're using data that you get from external sources uh, in, a, in an integral way. Problem with that in Postgres, we actually do that a lot. If you think about what Postgres does a lot is reads a block from disk and sort of trusts it implicitly that this has the right structure. And then just assumes, oh, if there's the length byte here of that, we assume there's that much. And if that doesn't work out, it just, you know, bad things happen. And so essentially, we trust whatever's in the data directory implicitly. And, and so all these taint checks don't really work for us. Uh, which, you know, there's probably a lot of taint checks amongst those 1,500, but who really knows if there's really one that there's a problem. So for exa another example of this is. If, for example, PG Base Backup, there was an issue, I don't know if that's still there. If PG Base Backup pulls down incorrect data from the, the server, you can make it crash potentially by having like a, a division by zero somewhere that, that as possible. It's not a huge issue if you don't, you know, your goal is not to make PG Base Backup crash. But the opposite of that would obviously be a much bigger problem if you send incorrect data up to the server and the server crashes because you sent zero somewhere. So, but they can't really tell what is more important than what, right? So that's hard. Um, let's see if I can pull up a web browser here on this. Where did it go? Oh, there it is. Okay. Okay, cursor. So this is the sort of dashboard you get here. Let's make it a bit smaller. <coughs> okay, let's see if this works. Does that mean you need like to do more than once, or is that just like the back branch? The back branches don't seem to really work because they only I can only find one with the PFAS there. But uh, uh, well, the actual interesting thing is is this one here. Where you can like go through all the problems here, and the screen is a little bit kind of funny now. This is interesting. I just looked at this the other day. So this is you have op here compared to this, and then down here you compare to that, and there's nothing in here that changed that. I just saw that last night, and it looked kind of funny. So that doesn't. I, I didn't. I seriously didn't pick that. I just looked for an easy example, right? So, you know, arguably a compiler could detect that also because it's pretty straightforward. But obviously, it needs more time to to analyze that. So, this is the level of uh, issues you got here. So, we will get him an account. I guess. <laughs> It, it is pretty cool. You can waste a lot of time in there. So the open source alternative to that is, is scan build, which came out of the. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll show you later. Which came out of the LLV. Oh, do you want to, Stephen? Do you want to explain how Coverity's build is in your basement, and then it's uploaded? Okay. Hey, it's not the same physical box I actually did from. So. Okay. No, it's not. I'm just saying it's 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 so it is basically. 
someone in the infrastructure team regularly builds Postgres and then it's, it, you upload some binary blob to them and they analyze it. So it how is. How do we actually have more resources and things that we have to worry about now and mm -hmm. then we can worry about later? How does it scan build? Um, so scan build is kind of an open source uh, alternative okay. that came out of the LLVM project. Um, this is the URL. It, so if you want to use that, here's a recipe. So you can just try that yourself. Uh, most reasonably up-to-date platforms should have this uh, in a package that might be called LLVM or Clang. It is, yes, it is. It is in, it is an aggressive development, so you have to kind of, they do stuff and you do stuff in, in, in parallel, so yeah. Let's talk about it in a second. Um, yes. So if you want to build that, you download that tool. The O is basically where it stores its output. You configure it. You auto build with enable assert. And then you just build it. It takes like between half an hour and an hour or so. Um, then it tells you how many bugs are found. And then. What is it? I'll, I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, you don't have to, but it'll not be, uh, won't work so well. Um, and then there's this tool called ScanView, which pulls up the result in a HTML um, report, similar to what Coralu just showed. So let's look at it. As you can see, the uh, here are the uh, bugs. Look at you, that's fancy JavaScript here. Look at one, division by zero. So here's all the places where you have division by zero. So you can see all the, the queue sort will fail if you pass the si size of zero, that's by design. So you can't really do anything about that. The, the print routines will fail, for example, if you have if you have, if you print the result set with zero columns, which you wouldn't normally get, but you can fake as you know, we can fake that with you know tables with zero columns. But the uh, the reason why this is not a problem is that tables with zero columns also have zero rows, so no row is actually printed. So if you could fake up a result set, you could crash this, but in practice it's not a problem. But the, the, the fix in, in this whole situation is that you put an assert somewhere in there that will just say, you know, assert col uh, column count is, is greater than zero, and then you, you'll still crash, but in a more controlled way, and this tool will know about it, and some of those things go away. That's why you need to build with assertions. Problem is, in the back end, you can turn assertions off at runtime, so none of that will work because the, you know, the code path analysis always has to analyze the path, well, what if assertions are turned off? Then I have to look in this path here, right? So that, <laughs> that just doesn't work. So this tool doesn't know about that. They, Coverity has somehow, they said they had sort of manually tweaked something so they know about that. Uh, uh, maybe that, that used to be a while ago, but they have, you know, they have the same class of problems in any case, so. Um, a, a, a lot. Um, so let's look at another one. Find values, garbage on your functions. So, you know, Bison generated code apparently has lots of problems. We don't, <laughs> hard to argue about that. Here, um, here is something in parser. 
you can see it gives you kind of this path here. You can go look, see how, how this comes about. So this is this function, which gets in a list of arguments, and then, no, this is old. Well, and the, the, you know, the, so this goes, loops around here, and assigns the arguments of the list to this array, which is, has this uh, fixed size. So if you pass in a list that's longer than that, you will have problems down here. This, this will not actually fail in practice, because like three levels up, there's a check that you can't you know, on the more semantic level that you can't pass in anything longer than, you know, func mark x or func max arc. So, right, so the fix again here would be to pass in an assertion, uh, to, to put in an assertion, but the problem is the, uh, this will fix that, but as you know, this is not actually the, yeah, this is not actually the problem it's complaining about, right? This, the problem is down here, where it loops through that same thing again and assigns it back into a list. But it has no knowledge about lists, so it doesn't know that by exercising this loop, you do a number of steps of something. It doesn't know that at all. So it, it would have, even if you put in an assertion that list length is something, it, it has no n knowledge of, of how these structures work. So so all the lists are in, in user space, so to speak. It has, it, I don't think there's anything you can do here to, to fix that. So the reason for the doesn't even compute the length of that list and the length of each step. It, it doesn't know that that's a list that has you know properties of any kind, so that's hard. It's too annoying. No, the the. If you just assert, it will know. It will know. It know what, what, what assertion does. Basically, it, this code path is is not relevant, okay. right? So uh, Unix API, I had something in syslogger. This is a common problem: passing a null pointer to a function that shouldn't get one. And if you trace this all the way back, this. A value is is assigned as a result of a PL log, but this tool doesn't know that PL log never returns null. So that might be something we can instrument somewhere, uh, but I haven't figured out how to do that. But that that would possibly help in a lot of cases. But in a lot in their GCC also has some attributes you can put on functions that tell you that this argument shouldn't be null. But I don't think they have an attribute that tells that this function never returns null. So that's actually what we could use in a lot more cases. So assert would help here again. So, and you, uh, there was a question about wh what about the, the e-log issue, and uh, we, we added, um, if you also add no return attributes to function, it will also you know, prune a lot of potential code paths and, and, and reduce a bunch of issues, so. No, I, I think you just do the no return. That's it. Because no, yeah, it would have to. It would actually have to trace through, you know, and then see that it's a long jump in some cases. But it, you, it potentially could do that. But I don't think it like digs that deep. That's I think the problem, you know, because you have to do it. You have to have a trade off of how long this thing is going to run. I, I think. Don't know any tools to do it. I'm just yeah. So this is the number of bugs we, uh, or reported bugs we've had over time. And at some point in 9.3, I think, is when we put in a bunch of no returns. And that, as you can see, that helped a lot. Um, prerequisite for this is that you get Clang to build without warnings, because it's kind of the same foundation. So a lot of the old releases have just basic Clang bugs that we didn't attend to at the time. Uh, the There's no particular reason why 9.4 has more. I was kind of surprised by that. but. It, that there doesn't seem to be any uh, systematic uh, change there. It's just certain in unrelated changes ha have, have uh, potential issues, but it doesn't seem to be serious. The, the star column there is kind of a branch I have made myself where I have made assertions that you can't turn them off, so it prunes certain code paths and uh, 
we've done a, a few other possibly controversial tweaks to kind of see how where you can get that number. But um, I, you know, ideally, we'd like to get that to to zero because again, this comes back to the the warning versus error issue. If if you you know if you always have to compare numbers, you're never going to get really a boolean answer. So, but as was mentioned, scan build is still in, the lo in, in, in development and things come and go, so it, it's kind of hard. But this is a useful tool that everyone can use, open source, and you, you can play around with it. So, Richard, you're using that apparently as well? Yeah, the older version is Yeah, so. Yeah, I you know I, sh I should have if I had more you know if I would would have wanted to stress this laptop more I could have done this you know for n releases and it would have probably taken many days to build but you know so another uh, static tool that came out of LVM is uh, is the address sanitizer which actually came out of Google for their Chrome browser I I believe and uh, but it's now a, a it's now part of the Clang compiler and SF. Uh, GCC 4.8, it's also part of, uh, you can also use it in GCC. So the way this works, you give it this option, sanitize address. This one is the key one. And then these are recommended to get better backtraces, but they're not the key here. And then you build it, you run whatever check test suite you might have. And if there's a problem with uh, whatever this checks for, which is mainly buffer overruns, then it will crash at this point. And then it will print to standard error a cryptic backtrace. And then there's this script it comes with that you can run this back uh, backtrace through, and you will get an out, uh, a backtrace, which I, I can show an example of. What is it? I, I don't know what these do. They also just recommend it to, to get better backtrace. I don't know what that is. I've never actually seen it. This is a Clang option, so I don't think you might not have seen this in GCC. So. This, this is this is more well known. Yeah, I don't know what this does. It's it's a uh, it, it's in, in the recommended set of options. So one issue we found this might look familiar to some is this issue in uh, this was a non-issue. That's why this was ignored for a long time. If you run name through a copy, it will do eventually through a copy of these two things. And there is a certain case where these are the same. So you would think that's fine because it just copies it over the top of itself. And for you know the last 20 years or so that did <laughs> work fine. But, but this thing would f found it for you know, because of strictness reasons and it was ignored for a long time. But then the, some new compiler in Mac OS 10.9 actually complained about this or crashed here you know, just as part of the regular compilation. So at that point, it needed to be fixed. And then address sanitizer was happy. And once you fix that, you this is a real issue that we found. Here um, you get the uh, view select rule name, which is a, a string constant or a string, a C string. And you cast it to a, a datum, pass it to this prepared plan, which expects a name datum there. And in most cases, that's fine because you know, the name is just a 64 a byte string. But at some point later down here, this string gets copied in, into another uh, into a copy of itself. And it, that will then copy the full 64 bytes, whereas this does not, is not 64 bytes long. So that's a, co a confusion between C string and the name. And so address, this could have been a real problem when someone is actually at the end of memory. So this, this was useful, and this was fixed. So the, the problem with address sanitizer is it just whenever it finds the first problem, it crashes. So you need to fix that or at least work around it before you can get to the next point. So how, how do you do that? OK, I, I didn't find. Well, obviously, you can just comment that out, and you can <laughs> pass by, right? So it's just for analysis, but. Uh, I'm not familiar with that, but so this is the so, what it, <laughs> so this is uh, this is the current issue. This is as of now, um, which is actually kind of weird because it it will 
worked fine on 32-bit builds, but it will do this crash on 64-bit builds. And this was discussed on the mailing list uh, a few months ago, and it was actually argued that this is not a real problem, so you know, don't have to worry about it too much, but it, it will crash r this way if you do it right now. So it would be worth fixing that at some point. So yeah, so Volgrind is, has received a lot of attention in the community lately, and it's it's a much more general tool. And in, in actually on the website, they now describe themselves as it's a just-in-time compiler, pluggable just-in-time compiler, right? So it can do a lot of things now. But obviously, it's uh, more known as a memory checking tool. And yes, you can also use Volgrind. They, all of these tools, <laughs> all of these tools overlap in some degree, right? The Coverity can check, mem find memory leaks when, if it can reason about it statically. Volgrind will find memory leaks just because it keeps track of it and it has more. It's, it's, it's more guaranteed to have a good answer. So, the important thing I would like to do more with Volgrind, and I think a lot of people here are of the same opinion. You can do a lot of things. So here's a couple ways you can use it. A lot. Of, uh, this is, I think, something that Heike posted just the other day as an example um, to do backend work. Something I've looked at, so here's a wiki page that um, was put up recently to, to um, also cover some of that. One thing I'm kind of interested in is also memory leaks in front end programs. For example, in PG dump, you know, memory leaks could be kind of a problem, but are not well tracked at the moment. If you um, actually do this, you will get a memory leak, but as you will see, it's kind of a, a stupid one. So this is what you get from PG Dump right now, but as you can see, the memory leaks are in undesired vacuum due to the same problems. So yeah, here it is. So here, and this is every program in Postgres, or at least client programs, this problem that it allocates a few strings for locale services at the beginning of the program and then doesn't free them. So anytime you do this, you'll, you'll get this sort of uh, trace. And as we know, we can add suppression files to get rid of those, which I would like to do to basically get all of these things down to zero and uh, then be able to run Test suites again with a you know a boolean answer at the end whether there are known problems or not but we gotta fix some of those first. Um, so you know this was specifically a, a, a leak check. A lot of the other work that has gone in in the back end is um, access to memory that you shouldn't access of various kinds, which is what this uh, down here would find. And there's been a lot of work on that lately. I only found actually 19 commits mentioning Volgrind, so we haven't really done a whole lot, but there, there was a lot of activity just lately. So one of, one of my goals is to basically be able to run this automatically and just give you an exit status at the end. You look very concerned, Greg. Last time, <laughs> yeah, last time Volgrind, it, it surely runs at this level. Yes, this is, yes, I should have made the uh, segue better. So. The, uh, Is that so? I, I've not, I haven't had that <laughs> problem, really. <laughs> you, you would know a lot about running things on smartphones, so I'll believe you, yes. Yeah, if you're interested, this is th this wiki page is all we have at the moment. It doesn't even go into this much detail, so a lot of documentation work can go into this. Um, trace children is important in the back end because of the forking. I don't actually remember right now what trace oranges does. And the read var info is just so you get a better backtrace. Do you know what the track oranges is about? Okay. Does that have to do with the pal the palog instrumentation we added recently? No. 
Yes. You say this runs a lot slower. Yeah, it's like I think it's like twice as fast. So offline it does more help than it used to, but it's like the same thing. Right. So I think some more documentation here would be useful. And I think also if you do run and report problems, you got to report on how you ran it because there's different things you can check about, right? Like, but uh, so I, I see this sort of as a progression of, of uh, tools that get more sort of intensive. So you can, you know, start with compiler warning, static analysis finds a lot of memory issues as well, but they can only reason about it statically. These are runtime tools and they, are, you know, they have runtime knowledge of what's actually happening, so that's uh, great. Um, so in order to actually get anything useful out of this specifically, but also this, you need to have uh, tests that exercise this, right? So, and we talked about some of that yesterday. So, there was a company called Sun a long time ago that uh, in the Postgres community, and they actually submitted this, uh, they contributed this feature. And it wasn't me, um, it was someone else. Um, so this has been there for a long time. I just want to remind people how, how this works. If you want to find out whether something, uh, what the test coverage is of any given test or anything you run yourself, use this, enable coverage, make, then coverage clean just deletes the HTML output from the previous one. After a long, puzzle, many puzzling nights, I discovered it's best to run with max connections equals one, so you don't have any concurrent stuff happening because the output files overwrite each other at runtime, and then it, it just produces garbage, so that might be useful knowledge. And then, you know, it produces HTML output, and you can look at it in your browser. So look at that. I have a Jenkins job that does that. It looks like this. Yesterday, Hickey was complaining that a previous vacuum is not exercised, which you can see here. So, you know, there's a lot of arguments about like how much coverage you need and all that. So that's different. That's a different problem. But red is probably not good, right? So I think we can agree <laughs> to that. So Zero is SPP. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well. <laughs> yeah, so we know we don't really have a lot of knowledge about that. Right. Yeah, and, and you know, all I'm, all I'm, yeah, so all, So obviously this is not about you know how to design tests and stuff. That's a bigger problem. I, I think this is more like of a 10 to 20 percent solution to issues we could possibly have. But actually, you know, designing tests is obviously a, a much harder question. So let's talk about go to fail. We talk about hard bleed. Let's talk about go to fail. Um, so for those who don't know, go to fail was an issue in the uh, Apple SSI libraries where they had accidentally duplicated a go to statement and then it skipped a bunch of, uh, what is it? Right, so I, I tried to so I tried to replicate it and I made this patch in Postgres, <laughs> just locally, so no, don't worry about it, um, and, see, and see what would happen, right? Um, so it's, yes, so <laughs> obviously, obviously PG indent is kind of helpful in this situation, right? Just on a, on a side note, that's, that's good. Also, if you do this, Tests will fail because the protocol is all messed up. So you will see this, but this could be in, you know, in the actual SSL code in Postgres as well. It also has go tos in it and is not exercised in the test suites that people we usually run. So this could be a big problem. And uh, there was no compiler warning. Scan build didn't say anything about it. I didn't check coverity. I have more confidence that they might find that, but I, I couldn't, you know, submit my own build. But th this could, you know, this is not a trivial, trivial problem to, to address. So this this could happen. I, if you know that option, I'd be very interested because I've tried a lot of them. Did they remove it? Yes, yeah, there was a long time ago in GCC on th that code analysis which they removed because it was uh, it didn't work. 
and do <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 a hard problem, right? In again, in, in languages like Go, for example, they have you know made a, a strict decision in the language design that that code is not allowed, so they will give you an error. You know, in Java, they have made sort of a, a compromise, but it's a well-defined compromise of when it is allowed or not. In in C, it's, there's a lot of things that are possible with long jumps and if defs, and so it's not possible to design an option that works for everyone. You know, but you're claiming that. There is now a brand new option that might catch that. I'd be very interested. But there's. The yeah the the again if you run a tool like I I am not familiar with Lint. But it it will then give you you know possibly thousands of unreachable code in your Postgres database. That's the problem. So yeah, I, this is an open question. I don't know if anyone has a good idea. I just tried sort of the, the usual tools that, that we have available. If anyone knows how to fix that, would be a great addition to this suite. Is there any way to run the I, I think so, right? Yes. But we'll, we'll see. What's Chris? Well, Splint is on my list, right, of other things to try. Um, I, I, I I have played with Lint, I should have added Lint here. I've played with Lint on and off. I, again, you know, if it gives you a thousand reports, it's not helpful. It needs to have, it needs to be really, and, and Splint is in the same category. It needs, it, it has promise, and I've heard good things about it, but it needs to be tuned the heck out of it to understand everything that's going on. And, you know, it has a bunch of options like, are you using C this or C that, or Postix or Unix, what are we using, right? We have a, Really custom combination of all these things. How do you tell that? It's it's very hard. Um, Clang has a bunch of other sanitizers that uh, are in, worth trying out, but they haven't really done anything for me yet. The the uh, sanitize undefined would find undefined behavior. I've never found anything with that, but that's probably good. The memory sanitizer um, only works on on a limited amount of platforms, so that, that's not really a, a good solution. But it, I. There's a lot of overlap with ball grind and address sanitizer and uh, any of these static analysis tools. So don't know. Uh, obviously, we don't use threads, but you know, but there's another thing out there. I mentioned Splint. This uh, Viva CDS Studio is um, some people might remember that that came out of on the hackers mailing list around New Year. That they this is a commercial tool where they they threw that at Postgres and reported some of the issues back, and some of them were fixed and. They're kind of an odd mix of, of things that they reported, but some of them were good. But I, I downloaded the uh, full list of of things they reported, and the entire list contained 51,572 issues. So that's not really that helpful. And uh, then someone said, well, this shouldn't actually be checked, because that's kind of a bogus check. So once I filtered that out, we're back we're down to 12,460, which is still not helpful. And there. You know, at that point, it's it's not a useful tool because nobody wants to go through that. And, and they're very picky, for example, about using, for example, the long type. And they tell you every time you use a long type, it tells you well, this type should have a different size depending on the architecture. So this tool might have come out around the time where 64-bit architectures were coming out, and people need to fork through it. Maybe that's why the name is. I don't know. It's a commercial tool. There's a link here if you get those slides later, but I don't think that's uh, going to help us much. I'll be on time. We're like way over, aren't we? He, here's the thing to to worry about a little bit. <laughs> so here's our lines of code. The C is how, how many committers actually contributed to that. So that's not going in the right direction, right? Then month since release and commits since release, and then how many commits per month. So that's also not going in the right direction. And Last is hours per day. That's not changing. So that's <laughs> you know that's that, that's you know that, that that's a problem. We know we're all getting busier. So I, I I hope with all these if we throw all these tools at it, we can at least you know make up the the, the difference there a little bit. Obviously, it's not going to help find more complex issues that we know about. So. I think this is more of a, a 10 to 20% solution if we put a lot of work in it, but I think it could be helpful. And I plan to do more work of that. If someone wants to join in, it'd be great. It's 
So I think the good goal for next release is to do a lot of work with is get ball grind and, and add a sanitizer working really well and add more tests to exercise some of the st stuff that's not exercised yet. And if people have issues with building with W error, let's find uh, let's help. Let's fix these issues if if we uh, if we can. So let let me know if you have if you need help with that. That is the last slide. So I think we gotta go. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. I'll be here all day. Thank you. <laughs>